So we're going to be looking at the life of Moses today and intermingling it uh, with some current events that are happening today. So let's start Exodus chapter 1 and verse 6. If you have your Bibles, you can open up there. If not, you can follow on the screen here. Now to give some stage here to set it up for you, you remember what Joseph did. He was responsible basically for saving all Egypt from what? A, a famine. Okay, very good. And also in the, the process of that, he's able to bring his father whose name was what? Jacob, also known as Israel. Okay, so in him, his family, which is the Israelites, okay, brought them to what town? Goshen, that's right, okay? Right there in Egypt, Goshen is there, and actually I'm losing here. Okay, and that sets us up for verse 6. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Now, let's do one more question for you. How did the Egyptians view the Israelites in Joseph's time? Anybody? They what? Okay, you say honored. Uh, Let's see a hand. We'll pretend we're in school for a minute. Yes, Gary. Well, I don't, not that point yet. Well, they did work the garden. It's possible at some point. Joseph's time. Anybody? Yes. Yes. Right, exactly, and tied to that is, remember Joseph had to actually eat at a different table, right? Because the Egyptians did thought it was not a good thing to eat with an Israelite, okay? So they were considered a lower class, somebody that you wouldn't sit and eat with. But yet there is that sense of Joseph's time, he was honored, but yet they still would not even eat with him. That tells you something. And so you've got this group of people that were off in this one kind of area in Goshen. And you've got this other group of people, the Egyptians, that are are looking down on them. They won't eat with them. But yet this one group is seemingly growing and growing and growing. Man, they are taking over our area. Okay, They're fruitful, uh, multiplying greatly. And verse 8 tells us, Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Okay, somebody that did not uh, remember or chose not to remember what Joseph did for the entire uh, nation of Israel, of Egypt, and forgot that. And verse 9 says, Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Now let's bring this a little bit home. Have you ever had uh, heard comments of a certain group of people coming into an area, and man, they're taking all of our jobs, they're doing all of this. Have you ever heard wind of things like this? Just imagine this playing out in Egypt. The the Israelites are taking over everything. They're getting way too large. There's far too uh, many of them at this time. Now here, let's look at a, uh, a current situation, or somewhat current situation There was another lady that thought that there was too many of a certain type of people. Uh, Her name was Margaret Sanger. Does anybody uh, recognize that name? Yeah. She is the founder of Planned Parenthood. And in 1922, she published a book. It's called The Pivot of Civilization. I want you to listen about the group that she thought that there was too many of and what her solution was. In this book, she unashamedly called for the elimination of human needs. So, just in case we miss anybody, human weeds. Thank you. I was thinking about what I was going to say next. Can anybody tell me what elimination means? Get rid of. Okay, let's let's spell this out. Unashamedly called to get rid of the human weeds. Now, we've got any gardeners here. What does that mean? They're, what are weeds? Those are good things, right? Weeds? No, you want to pluck out all of those weeds because those weeds are making your garden not look right. They're possibly affecting the growth of your plants. And so there's a group of people 
that are basically bad for the population, so they need to be eliminated. It goes on to say, for the cessation of charity. What does that mean? To cease giving? Stop giving to people. Uh, if you have poor people among you, you need to stop giving them because by giving to them, you're enabling them. And what needs to happen is they just need to go ahead and die out, okay? For the cessation of charity, for the segregation. Here's another big word. What does that mean? To separate, okay? For To separate, now I hate even saying these words, morons, misfits, and maladjusted. Morons. So in her mind, that would be those who struggle mentally. Misfits, possibly those who have stolen. I think at that time, you know, somebody was a drunkard. They might follow into fall into that category. And then the maladjusted, the people that are socially inept. Okay, all of these groups of people, she thought they should be segregated now. There's some of you that know that in our area, there used to be places where those that struggled mentally were put and they were segregated from society. And matter of fact, they were sterilized as well, as in the fact that they would not be able to have any more children. So this is not too far off. And then the last part, and this just burns me up, and the sterilization of genetically inferior races. Can you hear evolution here? Loud and clear. There's this belief that there are different races. We came from monkeys. And as we go on, you see the different races. And I'm using quotation marks here because I believe that there's one race. So it begins to go on. And then somewhere along the line, we reach the top. And of course, the top is the white people, right? That's in her mind because she happens to be white. So there's this idea that everyone else who is not white, you need to sterilize them and put them out of society so that they will not grow because there's way too many growing. Is that appalling to anybody? And this is the foundation of Planned Parenthood. Let's go back to the scripture. Verse 10. So the Israelites, this group of people that's growing, the king is saying, hey, we've got to deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. There's way too many of them right now, so we've got to act. See if you recognize this girl, this this person here. If you know his name, you've got to say it quick so the words are up there, right? Al Gore, right? Very good. Uh, Our former vice president and author of Inconvenient Truth, a book about climate change. How many of you have heard about him in the news uh, in the past week or month? You have, okay. A couple of you have. Uh, many of you have heard about Al, Al Gore's comments about Africa's growing population, that it would eventually outgrow that of China and India. He ties the population growth to global warming and says... <laughs> And says that fertility management, anybody know what that means? Sterilization or providing abortion for anyone who wants it. Says that fertility management is a solution to this situation that must be addressed. So this is an imperative that we have got to do something about this. Okay. So again, what I'm trying to say here today is that these are not issues of the past. They are current And I saw some remarks uh, on the internet and somebody said, well, why doesn't he start with his own children if he believes in this so much? But yet he, he chooses somewhere else to focus on. So let's go back to the scripture again. Uh, The king, uh, the Pharaoh is saying they're growing too much. We got to do something here. And then I want you to see a very important word that's at the very beginning. If. If. If war breaks out, uh, they will join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. You ever thought about uh, how, um, how powerful that word if is and how much we have used that in our culture? You know, what if this happens? What if that happens? Well, 
because of fear that that might happen, we do some very terrible things. Because of if, we devalue life. So verse 11 says, So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So what was the the purpose of the oppression? It was to get them to die out as a people, to eliminate them. So or at least to be more manageable. Uh, But here it has the opposite effect. They multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. When you hear this part, does it make you think of another time in our history? And this is sad as well. In our own history, there's a time where we had buildings like this, auction of Negro slaves. We see beatings like take place right there. Again, in that time in our history, we did not see the value of life. Again, that lie was out there, the same stinking lie of evolution that says, oh, these are a lower group of people. They're not like us. They're not as fully developed. And so we need to eliminate this race or let's make their life miserable at least. Verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives whose name were Shipra and Pua. Verse 16, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if he is a girl, let her live. So again, these, these uh, midwives were meant to help life to come in. They were there to value life and to aid life, but yet they're being asked to do the exact opposite thing. But that couldn't happen today, could it? Yeah, I want to tell you about uh, a, la- a lady. Her last name is DiCarlo. And this happened close to where you grew up in Mount Sinai uh, Hospital in, in New Jersey. You know what town that's in? But the administrators at Mount Sinai Hospital threatened DiCarlo with disciplinary measures in May 2009 if she did not honor a last-minute summons to assist in a scheduled late-term abortion. Despite the fact that the patient was, not a, uh, was apparently not in crisis at the time of the surgery, the hospital insisted on her participation in the procedure on the grounds that it was an emergency even though the procedure was not classified by the hospital as such. The hospital uh, has known of the Catholic nurses' religious objections to abortion since 2004. They had six hours to find a replacement, but they forbade her from seeking a replacement, saying that it was a medical emergency when in fact it was not. Basically, same type of stuff. The people were telling her, you have got to do this. You can't ask anybody else. We are forcing you to do this. Verse 17 tells us what uh, the Israelite midwives did. The midwives, however, feared God. They didn't want to do the wrong thing. They knew that that would displease God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And what I want you to see in this is that they saw value in the life of every one of those boys. And they risked their own lives to save each one of those boys. We'll skip to verse 22. After the frustration of all of this, Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. He said, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. And again, we see the echoes of this here. Unashamedly call for the elimination of human weeds, for the cessation of charity, for the segregation of morons, misfits, and the maladjusted, and the sterilization of genetically inferior races. Now, into this story where the midwives see the value in lives, we see the story of one important man. 
chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. Okay, so she took notice of the life of Moses, and she took action. She decided to protect him. She risked her own life to protect Moses. But when she could hide him no longer, can any of you mothers tell me why she couldn't hide him any longer? (laughs) She got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. So again, she's risking her life in all of this. Now, this was not a plan to drown Moses. Obviously, the, the, the pitch and tar is there to keep it afloat. But she has a plan behind this. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Now, this is placed in an area where there would be someone that could possibly care for Moses. So think about it in that culture. They didn't have uh, running sink water, right? So if you need water, where do you go? You go to the source. You go to the river. And so it's very strategic. She puts Moses, it wasn't given that name yet, but put her baby in this basket among the reeds so that the next person that would come would find, find this baby. Verse 4, we see the adoption agency. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Now, I just want to make one little point here. What do you see in uh, Moses' mother at this point? She knew that she could not take care of her child, right? Something was going to happen. Her baby was going to get found out and would have been killed And so she made an important decision. She said, maybe somebody else can raise my baby. If I can't, somebody else can. And I hope you can see through this an application for today's time as well. So here's the adoption agency. Uh, Verse 5, Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. And I don't think this is an accident. I believe that Moses' mother knew that this person would be coming down. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. Just imagine being there and being the one to pick up this baby. Open the basket. Hey, there's a baby inside here. And picking it up and hearing the baby cry. And she said, this is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. I want you to stop for a minute and put yourself in Pharaoh's daughter's place. Do you think she knew about uh, her father's order? I believe so. I think you can see that in the statement that she said, this is one of the Hebrew babies. Behind that, these are one of the babies that are destined to be killed in the river, basically. This is one of the Hebrew babies. Let me ask you a question. Why didn't she already stand up to her father? We don't see any record of that at all, do we? But yet, there's something that changes. What's the difference between when she is in the palace with her father and right here? She sees the baby. She hears the baby. And compassion begins to to beat inside of her heart. And I think we see that today. I am so thankful for the work that the Pregnancy Center does They have equipment uh, to show mothers their babies. Do you know the odds of them keeping the baby go up dramatically once they see the child? 78% of women who are able to see the ultrasound of their babies choose not to have an abortion. Just the simple fact of seeing that child. You know what? Because the language is out there. This is just a blob of tissue, uh, a product of conception. These are things that the baby is called, but yet it's so different to see the heartbeat, to hear the heartbeat, and to uh, see the baby. It changes everything. Verse 7, Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? I love that part. Yes, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) Don't you just love that? She gets paid to watch her own child. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. 
Verse 10, when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. So let's just stop for a minute and let's think about who is involved in the value of life. First of all, we've got the midwives that said, no, we are not going to kill any of those children. We've got a mother who risked her life because she saw the value of life in this child. And then we've got Pharaoh's daughter, who it wasn't her first thought, but yet when she saw the baby, compassion came over her. She saw value in Moses, and she took him. So here comes the day. We're going to begin to shift gears a little bit here. And we see that Moses is transplanted from his family. Now he's going to Egypt. So imagine going for a, from a place where it's kind of poor and you are looked down on to now to a place where you have everything, everything that you could ever want and treated like the best. Verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, guess how old he is? Did you know the scripture actually tells you? Acts chapter 7, he was 40 years old at the time. Okay? Acts 7, 23, if you want to look it up. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Now again, he may have heard about these things, of them being slaves, but yet it was different when he saw with his own eyes the mistreatment of his people. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and something stirred inside of Moses. He saw the value of the life of that individual. So looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. I want you to catch two quick things on this. that Those words beating and those, that word killed... They're tied to the same Hebrew word. They, they come from that same Hebrew word. So you're seeing the one beating, and then Moses comes back and beats to death. Now, we could get into a lot of ethics here, right? Was he right or wrong to do that? Let's stop and think about this just for a minute. It's all in how you put it. If the life of somebody is about to be threatened, if you see somebody beating Vic and you just stand by and watch, and he could possibly die, what, what responsibility do you have? But then on the other hand, should he have just restrained? We won't discuss that much further, but I want you to think about whatever it was, he still had to deal with the fact that blood was on his hands. Verse 13, the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Guess what? It comes from the same Hebrew word. Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? Verse 14, the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And at that moment, things begin to hit inside of Moses' head. Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Okay, put yourself in Moses' spot. And I need some volunteers to help me. What is Moses feeling at this moment? Anybody? Raise your hand for me, somebody. Yes, Emily. He's confused, scared. Yes, what else? Yes, there are times I believe he's feeling guilty. What else? Yeah. Fearing of judgment. Somebody is going to find me someday. Any other? Yes. Alone. Alone. Yeah. I mean, think about his life. He grew up in one home among the Israelites, and he's ripped away from that home to live in this other home where he has everything. And so there's a part of him that longs, for the songs that his mother possibly sung him when he was little. But yet he kind of made do where he was at. And then now he had this life of luxury. And then now everything has changed. He is running from his life. He doesn't know if he's a part of the Israelites, if he's a part of the Egyptians. He is completely alone. And like, 
who am I? Where do I belong in all of this? And added to that the feelings of guilt and confusion. Verse 16, Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their flocks, their father's flocks. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. Again, if we're going we're gonna to add the, the value of life here, possibly those shepherds took advantage of the fact that they were women. And Moses was there. He saw it all with his eyes. As he saw it, he was moved with compassion, and he got up and came to rescue, came to their rescue and watered their flock. Now, if you were Moses, would you have been that quick? What happened the last time he intervened? Somebody got killed, and he was running for his life. But yet, compassion moved him. He valued the life of those girls, and he got up and defended them and also watered their flock. Now, long story short, uh, one of those daughters, Zipporah, was given to him in marriage, and they had a son named Gershom. And Gershom tells us what Moses is feeling. I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. You know, when I read this, uh, my heart broke for a minute because I'm wondering if there's anybody like that, that you, you feel the same way. Maybe... You're here today and you feel alone. Maybe you didn't have the best father or mother when you were growing up. And you, you're kind of distancing yourself and, and you feel like you have no one now. Maybe you've suffered divorce and you're alone. Maybe you're like your family has separated you from you and said, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with you whatsoever. Moses is somebody that can, you can relate with. Some of you may feel like Moses. You may feel like you don't fit in anywhere. You feel like a failure because of the things that have happened. You struggle with your past. You're uncertain of the future. And you know what's happening right now when you begin to think about that? What's your, what's your value of life? A lot of you, it's easy to, have, to value the life of others. But when it comes to yourself, it's a little bit harder. So do I value my own life? I want to tell you today, God sees value in your life just like he saw value in Moses' life. We're going to see that uh, happen a little bit more as we go. But for Moses, he's walking one day, he sees this this flame uh, on a bush. It continues to burn, but it's never burned up. And the Lord says to him, and this is in Exodus 3, 7, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have seen what they are doing, how they are being treated as slaves. I have heard them cry out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. He has sees the value in their life. 8. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And this is another part that really stuck me as I was preparing today. But Moses said to God, Who am I? Have you ever been there before? You know, God wants to do something, you know, in you. And you're like, God, do you know who I am? You know, I'm the guy, you know, that didn't have the perfect family. You, you saw what happened to me in my life. God, don't you remember? I'm the guy, I'm the girl that did this and this, and you actually want to use me? Are you sure you got it right, God? Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And this part, if you're struggling with that, I want you to hear what God would say to you. And God said, I will be with you. Specifically, I believe God wanted me to share this with you. If you are here today and you feel like you have no home, you've been kicked out of your own home, or you feel separated from people, I want you to hear what the Lord would say to you today that he is your home. I want you to hear him say it to you. I am your home. You know, if you feel alone and separated from everyone, like you've given up hope, he says, I am your home. I will be with you. 
And this will be the sign to you that is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So for some of you here today, you feel like you can't be used by God and and you're all down on yourself. I want you to remember that here's the promise ahead of you. That one day if you'll submit and be obedient to me, you're going to be in a different spot in worshiping me because of what has happened through your life. Verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor, maybe we should say it this way, I've never, 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 never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Moses didn't feel like he could be used at all. Verse 11, the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Have you ever told God what you can't do? (laughs) First of all, you begin to remind God of your past and you tell him all the stuff, the reasons why you can't do it. And then you tell him of your present, you know, God, you got the wrong guy. I can't do this. I'm not gifted in it. And we need to remember this is that the most eloquent speaker that you could ever think of, God's the one that gave him that voice. The best singer that you've ever heard, God's the one that gave them that voice. Verse 12, so now go, I will help you and speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. You know, I'm trying to think through this myself, but I don't necessarily think that Moses really wanted to say that. I don't think it's that he didn't want to help, but what I I think is, that he was so down on himself. He remembered the fact, you know, that he took the life of someone else. He remembered the fact that the one time he tries to intervene, that people, you know, you know, don't listen to him whatsoever. He remembers his family past, and he, he remembers the fact that he can't talk. And for some reason, all of that is clouding his judgment, and he's saying... Just can't you do somebody else? You don't realize I am not the right one. And uh, I tell you, we're in a place today as a church that we need every single one of you, right? You know, I get, uh, there are so many times, uh, honestly, that my heart breaks because I know of a lot of needs and I can't do them all. I can't meet every single person. I can't... uh, I can't spend hours with every single person. How many of you are here today? We're probably maybe like 85, right? So if I spent an hour with each and every one of you and didn't sleep, think about it. It's impossible, but let's switch it around. What if every single one of you could be used by God, right? You can, and God does want you to be used by Him. So here's how uh, God responds to this compassionately, right? The Lord's anger burned against Moses. I think God had had enough. He said, he kept, Moses kept giving excuses. My past, I can't do this. Send somebody else. And God finally just said, he was was, was upset. You need to stop this. And I want to say this with all compassion I can. If you keep giving excuses and excuses and excuses to God, finally, I just want you to hear, it doesn't please God. You know, some people call it humility. You know, oh, I'm not good enough, and there's somebody better. But there is a line where humility becomes sin. And that line is when we disobey what God wants us to do. So the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. So even in his uh, being upset with Moses, he has compassion and allows his brother to be that helper for him. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. Here's our last scripture for today. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. Did I say the last scripture? I meant this is the last scripture. Verse 17, and Mel, if you wouldn't mind coming. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the sign with it. Basically put, yes, your brother can come along with you. It's okay. If you have to have him, you can have him. But yet, take this staff, and I want you to do this work that I have for you. 
What I want to say today, and I know this is a little bit smaller, and would you stand with me? We're going to begin to put these pieces together. I want you to listen close to this. God saw the value in the life of an Israelite slave oppressed. And really, he saw the value in each one of those Israelites that were being beaten. He saw every single one of those beatings that took place. And he saw the value in their lives. God saw the value in a boy whose life was threatened, Moses. He knew that if something didn't happen, Moses would have been killed. He saw the value in a woman being mistreated, one of the seven daughters that were there, being mistreated by other shepherds. He saw the value of the life of a man with a past, without a home, who doubted his abilities, who thought that there had to be somebody better, but yet had a heart for the oppressed. God saw the value in the life of each one of those. And here's the amazing thing in all of this, that God connected all of these people together, along with many others, uh, like a mother who could not care for her child, so she did the next best thing. She found someone else who could. Like an adoptive mom who moved at the side of a baby boy, took care of him, and saved his life from the clutches of death. God connected all these people to perform a mighty miracle, the deliverance of God's people. All because people saw the value in life and God saw the value in life. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Really, uh, the message today is two part. One part is we need to value all life. And some of the, the most terrible times in our history have come about Because people have devalued life. They've called what God has called life, they've called it less than. They've called it lower forms. They've called it blobs of tissue. And because of that devalue of life, it has grieved the heart of God. And many uh, promising people were not given the opportunity to be who God created them to be. Because people devalue life. That's a part of our history. And my prayer is that that would not be true of us. That we would value each life. Whether it be the unborn. Whether it be the disabled. Those who have a terminal illness. Those that others would say are of another race. A different color. No matter what that is. That we as a people would see the value in all life. And then secondly. And this was kind of my my heart that God put there is that I believe that there are some of you here uh, that honestly, you're just down on yourself. Uh, and because of that, you think, well, what's the big deal? You know, so I'm down on myself. The big deal is this, God wants to use you. And while you're in this state, you cannot be used by God because what's happening, you're giving excuse after excuse. You're telling God, why you can't do something. And so really the start of it is this. God sees value in your life. Doesn't matter what your past is like. Doesn't matter if you had a good father or or not. It doesn't matter if you're completely away from home and you're all by yourself. It doesn't matter all of those things. What matters is that God sees value in your life and he's calling. I believe that some of you today that God is calling you to step up and do something great for him. And my encouragement to you is know that God loves you. Stop saying no. Stop giving the reasons why you can't and say, God, I am here. I am ready. Thank you for seeing value in my life. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, uh, just for the sake of, well, I'm not going to do that. If, If anyone here, you feel like, that God is speaking to you today. That's you. And you want to say, God, I surrender. I am ready to do what it is that you ask. I'm going to stop giving excuses. And today, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. If that's you, would you just come down to this altar? Here's what I'm believing, that as you come down to this altar, God wants to extend his love to you. Not that if you don't, he won't. But some of you... You need to feel the love of God wash over you. You need to know that you are important in His sight. 
And I believe that your step of obedience is going to be like a, a removing of a wall, like the floodgates of his love will come over you as you step in obedience uh, to him. So if that's you today, and God's speaking to you, we just find your way down to this altar and say, God, I am willing. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. As Melanie sings this song, uh, if that's you, I want to encourage you to come forward. If you're, if you're down here, I just want you to commit yourself to the Lord and just allow the Lord to speak to you right while you're down here. Thank you, Lord. You're my 